I appreciate it. So one disclaimer, so I am not a morning person. So when Nicole scheduled me for this, I said, okay, I'm getting up early, I'm drinking coffee. So if I start to talk really fast, you'll know the coffee kicked in, we're all good. So we're gonna share a little bit about adaptability and, and flexibility. Um, so even in, a, even in a session yesterday, talking with one of the, one of the uh, the company reps, uh, they're, they're throwing around adaptability and flexibility as an interchangeable, interchangeable terminology. So what I want to do today is, is talk, it may be a little bit down in the weeds for some of you, but I hope what you look at and what you take away is really there's some, there's some common threads. And that's one of the things I love about, about yeah. this conference is you, you start to see amongst all the different presentations, there are certain threads that start coming through. And so hopefully you can take some of, kind of do what a futurist does. They, they look at isolated events and kind of put them together and say, okay, this is, this is kind of where, where things might be going. So we're gonna talk about a project we finished right before COVID, um, COVID kicked in. Our new College of Medicine, it is a, the Morsani College of Medicine, Tanaja College of Pharmacy, and the Heart Institute. So the first five floors are the College of Medicine, uh, kind of getting more private as we go up. The second, the, the second tier, so where the, where the building kind of slopes back, is our Heart Institute. And the top floor is our um, Tanaja College of Pharmacy and a vivarium. You know, the mice get the best views of the whole thing, but, but anyway. So when we kicked off the project, we looked at it, we knew this was gonna be USF was moving. This was our first major building downtown in downtown Tampa, part of a $3 billion rebuild for downtown. Really exciting. We were going to be the first building to come out of the ground. It's time to make a statement. So we created some guiding principles for the project. We kicked off the project and our, our dean of medicine, who's very tied in with the um, American Academy of, of Medical Colleges and, and stuff like that, told us that, I mean, think about this. From all the way from Hippocrates to 2016, that body of medical knowledge doubles every 120 days. Just think about that, man. That's a, that's a heck of a thing. I mean, it's, it's hard to really grasp your mind about that. What does that mean for, for education, though? So we said, really, if that's the truth, the days when medical doctors are memorizing stuff, that's gone. No more of that. You've got to be able to be a curator of knowledge, be able to identify what's good research, what's bad research, and be able to, it really changes the way medical practitioners are going to be practicing in the, in the future. That also has got to change the way medical education is taught. And here we are, we're building buildings that are supposed to last 70, a hundred years, all right? We don't know what education is going to be like in 10 years. So how do, we, how do we design that? So we developed a series of guiding principles for the project. One of those was flexibility and adaptability. That sounds great. What I'm going to share is some of the things we did right on that project and some of the lessons we learned throughout the project. Um, kind, of, kind of fun story, share some stories as we go. Uh, but really, the other interesting thing, as, as time went on in the project, uh, we ended up giving a lot of tours, and I'd, I'd accompany the dean through that. And as we started construction, he'd say, you know, the body of knowledge for medical education is doubling every 75 days. I'm like, whoa. By the time we ended the project in 2020, medical education or medical knowledge was doubling every 23 days. Now, I don't know, it's two years later, I don't know what it is, but it's just, I mean, that is mind boggling. But that is, that's the world that we're doing today, the world that we're living in today. So we looked at, all right, I actually looked up the definition of flexibility and adaptability. So flexibility is the willingness to change without compromise. The ability to be easily adapted, modified, okay? the quality of bending without breaking. To me, I mean, I'm a baby boomer, just on the cusp of, of a baby boomer, but to me, that's Gumby. That's Gumby, I love Gumby. 
I mean, I, I talk to our team about putting on your Gumby suit and being flexible all the time. Okay, that's Gumby. My other favorite toy as a kid was Legos. Legos are great, but they're not real flexible. If you've ever stepped on a Lego as you're, as you're walking around, not flexible at all. Okay, they hurt. But you can make them into almost anything you possibly want. And that is the cool thing about Lego. So adaptability is the quality of being able to adjust to new conditions. Subtle difference, but huge differences. The capacity to be modified to a new use or a new purpose. And that's the difference between flexibility and adaptability. And as we start moving forward, we've got to understand those differences because they have huge implications for the building. Now, a long time ago, it was, it was kind of fun to listen to Kim Lear, because a long time ago, I learned there's a difference between generations and the way they talk. So I've got, a, I've got a daughter that's going through school. You know, She doesn't know Gumby, but she knows slime. Slime is always going to be slime to her. It's always going to be green. It can change shape, but it's always going to be slime. Transformers, again, her generation, they can be a vehicle, they can be a monster, okay? They can, they can adapt. So you've got to, as you, as you communicate, understand who your audience is, what your, what your audience is. So we, we started programming the, build, programming the building, and we looked at it and said, okay, medical colleges are the first two years you're basically in class. The next session, you are, you're doing clinicals, you're outside the building. So we looked at it and said, okay, we've got every class of medicine is 184 students. Add on that our physician assistant program, you've got basically 200 students in class. When you put those two classes together, you've got 400 students. So we need a place that we can gather 400 students together. We also need some classrooms. We can break that up. We need some 100-person classrooms. And then we need to break it up even more into 25-person classrooms. They also wanted to change some of the, some of the mentality because, um, and I, I won't get into this real deeply, but, the, but medical students, a lot of students, spend a lot of their time, very intense, um, actually studying in the building. So we created some of the learning communities. Basically, it's, a, it's a, a Hogwarts, where they put the different years together. Uh, but it's a, it's a home away from home. They broke each class into a, a group of Hogwarts houses. And each group has a learning community. They can go. It's got a microwave. It's got a Keurig. It's got a coffee maker. It's got a refrigerator. It's got lounges. It's got a place that they can sit there and, and play gaming, all that kind of stuff. Really is a cool place, but it's a place where they can get away, de-stress. But that's not really, when we look at this programmatic scheme, that's not really flexible. So we said, OK, let's break up the 400-person classroom. We need to have two 200-person classrooms. All right. We think we can do that. Break the 100-person classrooms into 250s. Break the 25 into groups of 12, small groups. What that does and what that really means is we can put the whole class in a 12-person classroom, a 25-person classroom, a 50-person classroom, a 100-person classroom, a 200-person classroom, or a 400-person classroom, all at the same time. That may seem like a duplication of space, but really what it does, it allows it allows you to take, um, it allows you, and I'll look at the, the big diagram, it allows you to do a lecture and break up, kind of like what they're doing here, break up the lectures in 20 minute groups, okay? Because adult learners can only focus for about 20 minutes at a time. So you do a lecture on the history of the, the stethoscope. How does that work? Why was it created? You go into a 100-person or a 50-person classroom, and you learn, OK, the, the cardiologists, OK, this is how you use a stethoscope. The internist, this is how you use a stethoscope, and, and all those different kind of scenarios. Then you go into our ultimate, and I'll talk about this, our experiential learning lab. 
It's a hands-on, flexible, ultimately flexible learning lab. So you go in, you go from the, the theory into this is how you actually use it, go into the small group learning room, get a little critique, say, okay, you know, Mr. Cardiology, okay, you, you put the, third, the, uh, the stethoscope here, try it actually here. Go back in, try it out, and they can bounce back between pedagogies in a short period of time and really take the hands-on, take the theory, take the, the interaction, and change the way education is delivered from being in a classroom for 60 minutes at a time to 15 to 20 minute chunks, very easily, very quickly, very flexibly. So we created these small group rooms. Again, these are 12 to 20, 24 person classrooms. Okay, we've got a, got a partition right down in the middle. You can see it in the middle picture. You can divide that partition. We also looked at um, all of the furniture in this building. Everything's on wheels. All the chairs are on wheels. All the tables are on wheels. Everything can be moved around, configured. Everything's modular. Um, everything, everything kind of fits together. The students can move it around. You know, they come in at, in the evening, study. Things are, things are totally moved around. The other thing we learned, and one of the interesting things is um, as, you're, as you're going through the process, you're going to have unintended consequences. So we went, we actually took a trip up to Steelcase and looked at um, people actually learn and people actually socialize differently. So we wanted to provide a, a, a bunch of casual learning spaces, kind of like in the, the bottom right. We implemented this, we put the furniture in, we started giving tours around the, for the faculty, and they said, you know, this is pretty cool because there are things that we actually teach that this would be a better teaching scenario than a 100-person classroom. So it puts, that, it puts the power back in the, the, uh, in the hands of the, pra the, uh, the teachers to say, okay, this is the subject I've got to teach. How is the best environment? What is the best environment to teach that subject in? And then have the space reinforce the topic as opposed to trying fitting everything in. I'm going to zoom in in here, OK? So as a result, there are things like um, how to recognize a student or uh, how to recognize a victim of human trafficking. That's taught a lot better down in the bottom right hand thing than in this situation. OK, here's our, our different furniture layouts. Again, you can see all the furniture is modular. This is our, hundred and, our 50 to 100 person classroom. Same scenario. Furniture is a little bit different because, again, it wants to fit a little bit different. We actually developed uh, furniture layouts for each of these different furniture layouts for each of these spaces. We have a, a small pod, so it's a, what, an eight person, a six person, a 10 person, and then the classroom scenario, how do these actually lay out? Because our fire marshal said, all right, how are you going to make sure that everybody can get out, regardless of how these are going to be, going to be laid out? So we laid out the different scenarios. We even had one where it was kind of a, a study group. OK, here's our experiential learning lab. It's basically a black box theater for teaching. So the, the white grid you see, we've actually got these movable partitions that slide around on that grid. They can be created into like exam rooms in an ER space. It can be one big giant space. During COVID, they actually set it up for a testing space for, a, uh, for the, medical, uh, the medical examining. So you can see the, I call them dummies, but they're not dummies, they're mannequins. So, uh, so the students use the mannequins, all very, very high tech, but it's, it's hands-on type stuff. They don't use cadavers for, for anatomy. They use, uh, they use the big screens for anatomy these days. Okay, study spaces. We've actually got 16 different types of study spaces, group study spaces, casual study spaces, um, different study spaces, spaces where you're in the middle of everything, uh, spaces where you're on the fringe. And then we get into the auditorium. So when you think of auditorium for a medical school, you think of a, a, a room like this, tiered seating, okay, grand rounds. 
And, and that's what you think of. Well, our guiding principle said we want to be flexible. A scenario like this is there is one setup for that room. So we said, OK, what if we did a flat floor? What would that mean? Well, that's great, but our auditorium's on the second floor. You know, you go to a hotel and most of the auditoriums, you know, big span spaces, they're off to the side. We've got a high rise building. We've got 12 floors on top of this. So we actually looked at what does it mean? What are the real benefits of being able to do a, a flat floor? We can have banquets. We can do seminars. We can do layouts. We can do teaching in the round. All right. Flexibility, adaptability, flat floor, that makes sense. So what did that mean? We've got to have a double height space. We've got to have clear columns, because they didn't want a column in the middle of their, their space. Um, and this is our auditorium on the right. OK, we've got, you can see down in the middle, we've got a skyfold partition that comes down, divides it into 400 people, 200 people. It means we had to have some huge transfer beams. We had four beams that were literally six foot wide, 12 foot deep, solid concrete spanning 84, 84 feet. They were pretty massive. They were a lot of fun to, to, to explain, but um, kind of drove our design team crazy. But it was worth making the investment in these huge beams to get the result that we really wanted. Okay, we had to think about lighting, sound, AV, acoustics. We put in a raised floor because we knew uh, moving things around underground didn't make sense with a, with a high ceiling. We actually went with the new technology. We put in in-floor Wi-Fi. Instead of having the Wi-Fi up in the ceiling, it's actually underneath the, the flooring system. It was kind of fun. It was the first time it was deployed in the world on a, on a large scale. Uh, we tested it. Cisco had to come back. They had to, um, had to reprogram it because they, they found some bugs, but it was, it was good. The ultimate result is we have a, a great space with a lot of flexibility. But again, communication is important. So quick story, and I'll, I'll jump on here. Um, so my daughter was in, in third grade, and the lights in her school kind of went dim. And they're like, all right, and somebody comes on the speaker and say, it's OK, stay in your rooms. A, a transformer down the street just blew up. And three of the boys in the room got panicked. They hid under their desk. I mean, what? To a third grader, what is a transformer? A transformer is a thing on the right. All right, you've got, you've got a, a, a catastrophe coming down the street. He's going to attack us. All right, to you and me, that's a transformer on the left. All right, so words are important. You've got to, got to know who your audience is. And so as you're talking about things, when you're talking about um, adaptability and flexibility, OK, our, our professor said, all right, we want to be able to teach in groups. Great. All right. Our architect said, we want to teach in groups. We'll design groups of eight. Well, we get ready to start the building. And the professor said, no, no. We want groups of six. Well, we had planned our, our whole electrical layout based on groups of six. All right. You take that difference, and the, the layout totally changes. So luckily, we did do a raised floor. Unfortunately, it means you have to pull up all the, the carpet tiles, means you have to unscrew the raised floor, means our design guidelines said you can have long conduit, but then you can have six foot whips. Well, you know, we probably would have been better off if we had 20 foot whips, because then we could have moved stuff around. We ended up closing down the auditorium for three weeks to reconfigure it to go from six-person groups to eight-person groups. Uh, it was kind of a pain in the rear. Just because you've got a raised floor doesn't mean it's easy to change. The other thing we learned is the furniture, look at the top right, um, every manufacturer's furniture, power and data fed a little bit differently. The Hayworth system is totally different than the Steelcase system. Steelcase power can only go one way. Hayworth can go either way. But the bottom line is you don't want the boxes laying up in the middle of the, in the, middle of the aisle. 
and make sure that you've got everything that's coming out of there can actually come out of there and the box can close. Uh, so those are some of the lessons learned uh, from, the, from the project. Again, flexibility and adapt adaptability are totally different. You've got to be able to, to communicate effectively. And, and so it's, you know, I was sitting there in my mobile office uh, one day in my car, sitting there on a conference call, waiting, you know, in between meetings. And as I'm sitting on the call, I saw this, this squirrel. He had, he, had, he had scored it big time. He had this apple. And I saw this squirrel, he, he struggled to take this apple all the way up into the tree. And he got up in the tree and he realized, this daggum apple's bigger than my head. What the hell am I gonna do with it now? And that's kind of what we do with, with buildings. We like, we've got all these great ideas, we get done, it's like, all right, what do we do with it now? So I would encourage you, think about it ahead of time, talk all the way through, talk about discussions, communicate effectively, and really understand what the difference between flexibility and adaptability is. So. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you all. Excellent presentation, thank you so much.